So you're you're going you're clearing the path. You obviously step on an IED. Step on the pressure plate. Yeah. Step on the pressure point. Or maybe it was a radio control. I mean, we don't know. And then 20 seconds later, you're laying on your back, looking up, screaming. Yeah. Combat engineer in the Marine Corps. Tell people who did not serve, because a lot of our viewers actually never served in the military, what that actually means and what were some of the duties in the Iraq-Afghanistan wars that your team did? Yeah, combat engineers throughout the military have a pretty wide variety of, of disciplines that they have to cover. Um, there is construction stuff, so, uh, you know, building forward operating bases. Um, there's sort of air wing stuff, like laying tarmac, things related to <coughs> air wing and that kind of thing. And then there's what I was, which is uh, breaching, explosive breaching, obstacles, minefields, IEDs, uh, and things like that. Um, so the way that that plays into the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were obviously we had to rebuild those two countries as we were fighting in them. Um, so in Iraq in 2008, we were doing a lot of uh, building the Iraqi police stations, building those up, um, and then all the, at the same time, uh, getting rid of weapons caches that were buried in the ground, having IED, you know, trying to find IEDs or responding to possible IED threats. So a, a lot of it has to do with uh, returning security to the civilian populace so that they feel safe. You know, I think a lot of people don't realize that because, you know, when I was in Iraq in 03, 04, 05, everything that made the country a country, like yeah. a police force, like people that pick up trash, like everything that would make a, a city function kind of went away. So here we are kind of fighting a war at the same time we're nation building and like you said, I'm having to build police stations. Yeah, and then another aspect of it too is, it, well, part of it is making the populace feel safe, but then there's also when, when I get attached to infantry battalions and infantry platoons, they're doing a kinetic push against the Taliban and the Taliban's using IED, so it can also just be for standard military operations where you're charging forward ahead and um, the infantry guys need you to help them with that IED threat that's there and you're not, you know, it's, there's not as much concern about civilian populace in, in those regards. I want to touch on IEDs in a second, but when you say explosive breaching, do you mean like you're on an objective and you need to make entry into a building or what, what do you mean by breaching? Yeah, uh, so that, yeah, using explosives to defeat obstacles. So, uh, yeah, what you would see, I'm sure a lot of people have seen a uh, video of the Battle of Fallujah, for example, mm -hmm. where they're taking quarter sticks of C4, putting it on a door handle, and blowing it up. And, or just, you know, in the movies where any time the FBI comes up to a door, they right, blow it off it, the hinges. Yeah. Um, but then, <clears throat> that's only one side. That's a physical obstacle. So there's also walls that you could, if you want to go, if you're on an operation and you don't want to go through the doorway, because it's likely that it's booby trapped or the, mm. the insurgents are sitting there with their guns trained right at that doorway. So you blow up the wall and come in from a way, an area where they didn't, wouldn't expect. But then also, um, we would explosively breach, we could explosively breach IED threats. So a, a good example of this is when we were doing our push into saying in Afghanistan, there were belts of IEDs. And so what we did was we launched a line charge, which is- What do you uh, mean by belts of IEDs? So just strung, air, strung yeah, together? Just like, or just imagine late. like minefields Got it. of yeah, IEDs yeah. Okay. Like, um, that they had identified through int intelligence. Or just areas where they figured there's probably going to be a lot of IEDs near, or there could be a lot of IEDs near, so we're just going to blow it up. Um, so what we did was launch a line charge, which is basically this 90 meter long rope of C4, 1,750 pounds of it. Jeez. And you launch it out of, the, of a big tank. And so then that lays on the ground and then it explodes, and underneath of it, it would blow up anything that's underneath of that little channel of, uh, of C4, and then you could walk <coughs> on that channel. You know, IEDs is a tactic, these, it's a very, you know, insurgent tactic, like, you know, especially Iraq, and I don't know too much about Afghanistan, I've never been there, just stories, yeah. but, you know, Iraq, it's not like two armies on the battlefield ready march and they're they're you know fighting each other it's these yeah. insurgent tactics and ieds i know my time was there i mean they were stuffing dead animals on the side of the roll you know digging potholes putting you know mortar rounds in it covering mm -hmm. it up I and mean, all kinds of stuff and that was it was it was a way for them to be effective at you know attacking us mm -hmm. 
Yeah, um, so the difference in IEDs mostly between Iraq and Afghanistan is Iraq uh, had a lot of leftover munitions from previous wars. Yeah, so a lot of the IEDs were made up of mortar rounds, artillery rounds, things like that. And then yeah, Afghanistan, they were doing homemade explosives. So they were making uh, ammonium nitrate and adding fuel oil to it, adding aluminum to it, and then making, um, eight, uh, I forget the name, whatever the chemical compound, but basically making making their own blasting caps, TAP, TATP. And so um, now wonder, that's the difference. I wonder if in Afghanistan they're kind of more the homemade just because the history of that country and the constant fighting, what they had to do, whereas Iraq maybe had more of a structured military at one point in time, so they had that munition. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so yeah. the Iraqi, Iran-Iraq war, there was just a lot of stuff right. there. Whereas in Afghanistan, there wasn't a whole lot of munitions left behind. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So they had to figure out. But, I mean, it's still taking explosives, figuring out a way that you can plant it in the ground or put it somewhere hidden, and then um, so blow it up. So what was, I mean, what? so let's take Iraq. Iraq's more uh, urban, would you say? Yeah, city uh, as opposed so. to Afghanistan. So, what yeah. were some of the tactics in Iraq that you saw? How, where were they placing them? How were they detonating them? Were they trying to get, you know, convoys, personnel, both? What, what was their strategy there? Yeah. Well, so, I guess in Iraq, <clears throat> well, the principles are all the same. You put your IEDs in the most in the locations that you think are most likely to be successful. And so, but I think how that would manifest itself in Iraq is different than Afghanistan because in Iraq you have um, conditions like there's trash on the ground sometimes in Iraq. Mm. In any in any city, there's trash, so you could stuff an IED in there, and it wouldn't necessarily be something that would seem outlandish um, to some people. So there's a lot of different opportunities that could be created with IEDs that would seem relatively normal. Um, whereas in Afghanistan, they kind of had to focus mostly on um, choke points. Mm -hmm. And so since Afghanistan is this, you know, landscape of you can pretty much go anywhere you wanted to, there would still naturally be choke points created by the terrain. So, for example, dry riverbeds that were, you know, 12 feet tall on the sides, they would be kind of a channel of travel that had happened from the locals. And so we're not going to if we're going north past this uh, past this dry riverbed, we're not going to scale down the 12-foot wall, walk across, and scale up. So we would go through this little channel that the the locals had built over time. Interesting. And so the Taliban would know mm -hmm. every time we go up there, we pretty much use the same thing. So they would plant their IEDs there, and then on the way back, if you know there wasn't one on the way back or on the way out. They might plant one, you know, on the way back. So you were in Iraq in 2008? Yeah. What was the main, what was your main mission there? Um, in 2008 in Habaniya, uh, it was after the Battle of Ramadi. So things were kind of dying down in Iraq. Um, so we were kind of in the, the build phase of the strategy, the clear hold build strategy. So part of our platoon was building Iraqi police stations, doing stuff like that. And then the other part was uh, working on getting these, uh, weapons caches out of the ground, and so, and the, like I said before, that was a bit that was, you know, mostly to help renew security, that safe feeling um, to the to the locals, so that they could then move on with their lives and try and you know get back what they had lost in the last uh, eight years. And how long? Years. How long was your two thousand eight Iraq deployment? Uh, seven months. So that was the standard uh, Marine Corps length uh, of deployment back then. And then when you redeployed and went home. You, I understand you volunteered then to go back to Afghanistan years later? Yeah, I volunteered for Iraq and <coughs> Afghanistan. I was a, a, a reserve unit. Um, right. uh, so, uh, yeah, they, they were just calling for volunteers, and I volunteered both times because I joined the Marine Corps to, to fight the bad guys and go to war with my, my fellow Marines. Was it a different train-up or different, I don't want to say mission set, but any sort of difference between the Iraq and Afghanistan deployment as far as mindset, training, mission, who you went with, that kind of that sort of thing? Um, not really in terms of the workup. I mean, we went to Mojave Viper and did all the ranges, and there was probably different technology that we had to learn. Interesting. Uh, like in 2008, 
the metal detector was different than the one we used in 2010 because they had been developing that technology. And then also they, they made uh, the route clearance vehicles. And, you know, we had route clearance platoons. And so they had these new vehicles like the Buffalo and the Husky that had its own ground penetrating radar on it. So we didn't really use that because we were always foot mobile, but we trained up a little bit on that. And then there's just tactics that uh, we learned about over the, over the previous two years and learning about that different kind of... Uh, IED that's in Afghanistan. So instead of worth thinking about uh, those artillery shells and mortar rounds and that kind of thing, we're learning about these chemical how to how to identify a bomb maker based on the chemicals and supplies that might be around there. Could you say one's more effective? I reckon Afghanistan was one more effective than the other, as far as lethality, deadliness, if you will. Not really. I mean, I guess when you uh, when you have the pre-made munitions, they're they're more stable because um, military munitions are made to be very stable. And so in terms of, you know, the guy actually emplacing it or the guy making it, they probably had less accidents that happened when you're, when you're uh, dealing with these stable munitions. And they also have shrapnel uh, associated with them, so there's going to be injuries uh, related to that. And then, you know, they, they did stuff like explosively formed penetrators. So there's different types of IEDs that could be more effective. And then uh, the ones in Afghanistan... Or just you know fire and shockwave. They could add shrapnel to it, but I don't think they really did most of the time. Um, then what, what was inside it? Just ammonium nitrate. Got so. And then they would add stuff in there like fuel oil or aluminum to make a fireball. Um, but the stuff that they were making, not the ammonium nitrate necessarily, but the TATP and the things that they used in blasting caps, uh, was it's extremely volatile. So it's really hard to make. And it's really hard to stay safe uh, when when you. So the people it. making those, I mean, they're they have a, would you say, a very strong understanding of what they're doing. I mean, very educated in that manner. Uh, I mean, more than your layperson, but I don't, you know, I don't think they were chemists or anything. <laughs> you know, it's a pretty simple process. I went to a ATF uh, course on how to make it, really? and you know, they showed us how it's done. It's a pretty simple process. How'd you get to that course? Was it part of your training? Or? Yeah, it was part of training. So it was important for us to kind of know uh, how these things work, how these chemicals work, and how they get made, so that we can then go in and identify, uh, you know, the equipment that gets used, and and kind of just kind of know about it. You know, you want to know about the things that you're <coughs> you're going to be uh, encountering. Yeah, it's going to be as well spun up on it as possible. So when you went to Afghanistan in 2010, correct? Mm -hmm. Was that were you primary mission then, IED clearing, munitions, destruction, that, that mission set? Yeah, it was mostly, so I was attached to, our combat engineer platoon was attached to 3-7, the infantry battalion, which is three companies. Um, and then each squad would go out to one of the companies. And then a fire team would go with a platoon. Um, and so I would be attached to these infantry platoons or infantry squads that were running missions as their kind of IED guy. And so whenever we wow. would come up to a place where we thought there might be an IED, like one of these choke points, or if we're trying to um, seize a compound or something, you know, I would go in and either make, I would clear a path and make sure that the there were no IEDs in that uh, choke point, or I would go through the compound and, and sweep it. How many times would you do that on a weekly basis? Or monthly basis? Um, is that a very regular occurrence? Yeah, I mean, every mission, uh, every time you go on a security patrol, there's usually a choke point that you reach that you want to check out. Yeah, for sure. So you're on a mission, you come up to a choke point. What's the first thing you do to evaluate it? Step one, step two, walk us through like a, 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 a sample, an example, if you will. Yeah, you know, you take a look at it, um, just try and eye eyeball it. And so you kind of, in Iraq... Uh, you kind of learn, or in an area where you're there for a long time, hmm. like if, say, you're in Ramadi and you're just running patrols all the time, you get a lay of sure. what the road looks like, what's around, what trash piles are there, all these different things. And so when you go out next, you see a pothole where there wasn't a pothole mm. yesterday or the, day or the day before yesterday, and you go, okay, well, there's obviously that's a sign. And so you're looking for signs first off. So anything that looks out of place. 
because the the natural world is it's it's random you know it's it's it, there's no patterns typically mm. and so you're looking for something that seems out of place so in afghanistan i'd be looking for different shades of, it's 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 hard but the different shades of dirt like the dirt might look a little bit sunken in or maybe there's something fresh over there that looks out of place when the rest of the ground is like this kind of baked um baked dirt um or they would mark uh, IEDs with stacks of rocks, or they would find different markers. Um, or you might look at the, if there's any civilians around, you might look at them and see what how, what their reaction to what you're doing is, because if civilians. they're kind of like, if they're out of there, if Huge they're not there. Huge tail. We were, dri dude, we were driving through Iraq. Anytime you see kids leaving, storefronts shut down, civilians going away, yeah. you know something's about to go down. Yeah, so things like that. And so you, what I would first do is, just look at it and see if I can identify anything like that. And then um, once that is done, well, actually, the first thing you do is make sure everybody else is a safe distance back because you're going into this area where there's a chance that you could step on something and you don't want anybody else to, uh, you know, to be injured by the blast that gets you. And do you have physical, I mean, handheld? Yeah, I have a metal lead, detector. Metal detector. Wow. Um, and then also, you know, you could, if you step on something, they could daisy chain it back. You know, they could, they could have one IED here, and then they could have detonation cord going back, and they could have other ones over here. Because they know that if you step on this one, your guys are going to be behind you. And then, um, so, you make sure everybody's at a safe, a safe distance back, if you can. <coughs> Sometimes you can't really do it, but. Um, and then what I would do is take my metal detector, and kind of, I would pick a rectangle basically to the other side, and I would stand and I would swing, start over here with my metal detector with the search head, you know, about that far, inch and a half off the ground, swing it directly in front of me, move it up about half the distance of the search head, which is maybe 12 inches or 10 inches or so, and then go back. And so I'm just trying to cover every square inch of this rectangle uh, straight forward. Uh, and then so I'm listening for uh, various signs that there might be metal on the ground. That's all it's really telling me is there's, there could be a metal signature. Listening to the metal detector. It's not saying like there's an IED here. Right, it's just right, saying right, there's right. metal here. That's all it detects. And of course IEDs have to, usually have to have some sort of metal componentry in there. And that's why we use the metal detector. Um, so I'm listening for, you know, a beep. So a low metal signature. Uh, would be a certain beep and then all the way up to a higher metal signature which means more metal would be you know it, it would go it would increase in pitch and then also increase to a point where it's beeping instead of just going a solid tone interesting um so i'll be <coughs> listening for that and just trying to decide if the the signals that my metal detector is giving me are worth investigating because there's this balance that you're trying to strike of expediency and safety. We're on a mission. Yeah, you're out we there in the open, you can done. get shot. I mean, you, you can yeah, be ambushed. Yeah, open, there's yeah. a lot of stuff that can happen. So, Damn. if I went all the way to the side of uh, safety, I would just be digging with a little teaspoon the whole way, and we'd never get anything done. We'd never, get, we'd never accomplish mission, it would take hours and hours. But if I went all the way to expediency, then we'd just be running through these areas and taking casualties. So, it's about trying to balance, you know, Balance what? those two things, mm -hmm. and then also uh, decipher what the metal detector is telling you, and then also any indicators that you saw with your eyes. So what's going through your... Are you just so focused when you're doing this, or what's going through your head? Yeah, you have to be entirely focused. Everything else Which means just... trusting your fellow Marines to cover your six, to cover your back, which is, you know, it's not that hard to do when you're, in, when you're a Marine, when you're in the military. So, yeah, I can't... I would usually sling my rifle. A lot of the times, you just put your rifle, get it out of your way. Um, Damn. So I'm, you know, swinging it back, back and forth, and then once I get to a certain point, I got to take a step. And so that step is what you call proofing the lane. And so the metal detector is clearing the lane. So I'm, I'm <coughs> determining whether or not there's an IED in the ground and calling it clear uh, without actually touching it. And then I'm proving that it's clear by taking a step. So walk me through a scenario. You have the metal detector, you hear a beeping, you've identified something, what do you do then? Yeah, if I identify something that is worth investigating, first thing you do is find the center of the metal signature. 
And so the way that I do that is I take my metal detector, I approach it from the right, the metal signature from the right, and I wait for a, a tone, like a high-pitched beeping, like beep, 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 like something like that. And then I would approach it from the left, and I would wait for that same tone. And I would just, you can mark it if you want to. It's kind of risky because you could be putting your marker down on a pressure plate. If you use like a little poker chip or something, it's pretty light. Well, if you, so you don't mark it, it what do you... If you don't mark it, you know, just... Kind of mentally have a You can mentally do it, yeah. Um, but you approach it from that same, and wait for that same tone from the other side, and then you do that from the front, uh, and you wait for that same tone, and then you approach it from the back and wait for that same tone, and then the, wow. the center of those four pieces, those four marks, uh, is the center of the metal signature. And then um, from there, you start to you start your actual physical investigation uh, of the metal signature, which we would use our hands. And some people like to use probes. So the classic view of a probe would be guys in Vietnam sticking their K bar in the ground. So a physical now is this personal preference? Is it strategy? Is there a strategy it's behind personal, that? Yeah, I mean it's personal. It, it, it depends on what kind of IED is kind of in your area. If it's mostly anti personnel designed IEDs, those are made out of like shampoo bottles. So they, they are very, very sensitive. So there's a, there's a chance you stick your probe in the ground and you set the IED off just by touching that, uh, that pressure plate. But if you've got a lot of, say, vehicle uh, or IEDs that are designed more for vehicles, like so ones in roads, it's, gonna be, it's hard to set those off. You are can step on it yourself. And it would, yeah, because they have metal springs right. in them and stuff like that. So it really just depends. But we would always try and err on the side of caution and just use our, our hands instead of sticking it in the ground. And you hold the probe in a certain way so that if you do hit something, you know, it, it pushes the probe out of your hand instead of you pushing in. But, you know, we just use our fingertips and you just kind of uncover the dirt until you get, until you feel an object and until you feel something. And then once you find kind of feel an object, you kind of have to uncover what the object is. You, you have to actually do an investigation and and then once you see what it is, um, you make your you make your decision. So if it's a battery, then you're gonna you could you have a couple different options. If you want to uncover it more and really get a good picture of where the IED is, you could keep doing that and just kind of slowly go, or you can just back off, pick another way, uh, go around. Would you have to destroy it though before the rest of the convoy or, or... depends on your mission. You don't have to. It's once you find it. Um, if you know where the pressure plate is, then you just don't step on it. Were you ever, it's, were you ever worried about them being remote detonated? Yeah, I mean, that's, it's certainly a possibility that that could be the case. Um, remote detonated, you could use uh, radio frequency or with a string, command detonation that way. Yeah, um, that, yeah that's, that's a possibility for sure. Um, and in that case, we would have man packable jammers Mm -hmm. We didn't always have them, yeah. Um, but usually the the jamming uh, signal, the the man packable jammers would usually defeat the radio frequency, and so the the majority of the IEDs in the area that we were in were pressure plates, mm -hmm. and so that's kind of what we were expecting. And there were a couple times where it was a command debt with a with a string, um, but it was mostly pressure plates, and so yeah, you just. You make a decision. You could call the EOD if you wanted to, yeah. to get them to come out and take care of it. Or a lot of us would just uncover it Go entirely, on. mark it with, you mark it with uh, chem lights, and then you just move on. You go around, pick another direction. Um, and then while I'm going, I have to be sure that I'm actually marking my little, my path, that my feet are take, that are walking mm -hmm. on um, with, again, whatever you have, poker chips, chem lights. I would sometimes have to kick the ground and like make little scuff marks uh, because you're only clearing for sure, absolutely sure, where your feet step. Like I'm not clearing this whole six foot Got section, it. or I'm not. I'm clearing it, but I'm not proving it. The only safe place to walk for your Marines or your soldiers or whatever is where you have walked, because that's the only place where you've actually proven. That's so why I was talking about proof of the lane, where you've actually proven <coughs> that there isn't an IED there by putting your own, you know, ass on the line, literally, and taking a step there. Wow. So walk me through the day in Afghanistan when you stepped on the IED and 
from that morning, you woke up, how did you feel? What was going down? What was the mission? Was it just like any other day? I mean, what, st take, take me through that. Yeah, so we were doing a push. We were pushing into Sangin, um, taking over from the British. And basically a push for anybody that's not, you know, kind of spun up on military lingo is uh, you, <laughs> you go in that direction and the Taliban either tries to stop you or they retreat. And so we were, we had a column of vehicles going, uh, I think, northwest. And I was with a squad that was kind of on the outside, outside of that vehicle column, providing security, looking out for ambushes, things like that. And there's, you know, gunfights going on, IED blasts uh, in various places. Um, but that day was relatively quiet for, for us, my squad. And... Eventually, we come to a point where we take a break. We're kind of reconnected back with the main body, and we take a break and maybe 15 minutes, get something to eat, that kind of thing, and then we step off, and our point man steps on an IED. And, and this is all dismounted, no vehicles? This is all dismounted for us, yeah. There were vehicles in the area, but we were all dismounted. Um, what size element were you guys, squad, platoon? It was a battalion push. Okay. But I was with a squad of 13 or so. Okay. And then we came back in contact with the battalion at that point. And then when we step off to kind of go our own separate ways, uh, our point man steps on an IED. Okay. And luckily, uh, his IED mal the IED malfunctioned. So just the blasting cap exploded. It was a very small, it's like a little firecracker going off, created mm -hmm. dust. Um, but that kind of, you know, that kind of thing can happen. Uh, these things are made homemade. So... Whoever made the IED could have messed up the mixture, or they could have put the blasting cap, their little homemade Ooh. blasting cap, in wrong, mm. or maybe the explosives got wet because the container leaked. Who knows what happened? But the uh, his the IED did not did not explode for him, which is good. But that tells us that there's IEDs in the there's neighborhood. There's another IED right there because one of the the procedures for Taliban and Al Qaeda too in Iraq and Afghanistan is to where there's one, they're going to put two, they're going to put three, they're going to put multiple ones because they know one guy steps on it, everybody comes running for him, mm. boom, the rescuers get hit, boom, the rescuers from over here get hit, so they they know. Yeah. So even when there's an IED strike, you can't just run over there because right. there's going to be you have to actually clear to the guy and obviously I don't know. That's rough. I don't know if anybody's ever done a full clear when they're doing that. I yeah. think you probably just risk your own life and run over there and get tourniquets on him because he's probably gonna. Uh, I don't think the guy, the guys that, you know, came to me. I don't know how how well of a clearance they did. So how trip. far were you when that first guy got hit? We were all at a leading point. I mean, are you within a 20, 30 foot? Yeah, we were all in that in that general area, probably you know within thirty feet of each other. But we were, able, and we were getting into a staggered column. But was he able to just stay mobile and keep? Didn't need a medical attention because you said it malfunctioned. No, it yeah, no, no injuries. Okay, just you know. So you keep scared. going. You, you keep. Um, but we don't keep moving because we know that if we keep moving, that's a danger area now. So any direction there could be another ID. So we don't know where it. it is. So I had to come up and start clearing <laughs> from that point, uh, that point forward into our, our into our area. And I did what I just told you about. It looked, it was an old area, so it could have been that I didn't see any visual indicators because the ground had already been baked back. Mm. Um, or maybe I just missed whatever indicator they may have been, or maybe there wasn't. Maybe this guy that buried him was just that good. Mm. Um, and then I went forward and had some hits, but didn't really... Uh, didn't really think that anything was worth investigating. And had then, some hits meaning hearing the beep. Hearing, yeah, hearing the metal detector going right. off. I probably, you know, if I could go back, I probably should have just investigated everything because obviously mm -hmm. there's going to be another IED in there. But, you know, um, it's a difficult, it's a hard thing to do. <laughs> um, but, yeah, and then I was just doing that, and then everything went black for me for about 20 seconds. So do you have a, you don't very specifically recall that second of stepping on an no. IED? You don't. No, I don't recall that uh, that instant. Um, what I recall is, you know, being being up here and taking a step, and then in an instant, it's like being teleported. Wow! Uh, being teleported to on my back, screaming, tunnel vision, uh, that kind of thing. 
So you're walk. Do you remember? Can you picture it in your mind actually walking with with the metal detector? Yeah, vaguely. I mean, the memories before right. um, are not great, and I've had other guys tell me slightly different versions of what I just told you. Interesting. But I'm kind of telling you what I remember. Um, so you're you're going. You're clearing the path. You obviously step on an IED. Step on the pressure plate. Yeah. Step on the pressure point. Or maybe it was a radio control. I mean, we don't know. And then 20 seconds later, you're laying on your back, looking up, screaming. Yeah, in an instant for me. Right. Probably about 20 seconds in real time. And I, I heard some other stuff you mentioned, prior videos I've seen of you. You talk about the, this conscious and unconscious mind. You, you, yeah. You didn't. You were you aware of the? I, I forget what you how you explained it, but you, you were aware of the screaming, but trying to stop, or what you, ha, you your body was just your mind was just taken over. Yeah, it was like my conscious control of my body pulled back entirely. Just kind of went into a shell, and then the unconscious. Uh, took over and so my body was reacting it was screaming and I had the tunnel vision and everything but I wasn't sitting there going hey lungs go and then do that I wasn't telling my body to do anything consciously it was just doing it on its own pure instinct I guess mm. uh, at least in from my perspective and but that after maybe 15 seconds of that I guess um, Maybe the endorphins came around. My my control started to come back, and that's when I started. You know, I could smell dust. I mean, I was I was pretty aware of what had happened. You know, I I knew what had happened. Yeah, you, hey, instantly. I stepped on an ID. Yeah, 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 it was pretty obvious. You know, even even during that period where my <clears throat> conscious had kind of pulled back, and so then I started being able to smell like the dust, and there's a there's a, a stench of. <clears throat> chemical explosions that when they go off, there's a distinct kind of smell. It's kind of hard to describe. Um, but I could smell that, and then I could feel that my legs were painfully numb. Like when you fall asleep on your arm, um, and it goes numb, and it hurts, like multiply that by 100, 100 times or so, and it kind of felt like that in my legs. So it didn't wasn't pain, but it was like this really kind of painful numbness um, and I could feel I was trying to I, be, I was trying to twitch my legs, twitch my, f or they felt like my calves and my feet and my knees were twitching, but you know, wow. nothing was actually happening. And then tell me about the immediate medical attention care yeah. that was um, tourniquets. Right. I mean, the guys that were with me were you know they they had to clear over to me at least in an expedient manner, hmm. and so they were screaming to me that they were coming, they're coming, they're on their way. They get to me, uh, Johnson and Otwell, they put uh, tourniquets on my legs. And I think they had to put like maybe two tourniquets on each leg. And that stops the, you know, the most of the blood. And then eventually the corpsman gets there, gives me morphine and puts the tube in my nose to clear my airway. Um, they take my flak vest off, put me on a stretcher, carry me to this tank that was sitting there. And then um, the tank took me to meet a helicopter. They had to call in a nine line or medevac? Yeah, they called in the Kazavac, uh, obviously immediately, but yeah. Yeah. So do you remember getting loaded onto the helicopter and, and flying off? Not the helicopter. Uh, I remember getting loaded into the tank, and then the doc gave me another shot, which made me go unconscious. Oh, wow. And then when did you wake up next? Next time I woke up was in Germany. So uh, literally from the tank, you didn't wake up until Germany. Right. This wow. was only about two days. Wow. Uh, so they, they intend to keep you sedated all the way back to the States, but I woke up in Germany. Huh. Um, like you weren't supposed to? I mean, I th I, it's not that big of a deal. Oh, okay. I think they try and keep you sedated. Yeah. Um, but it can happen where people wake up. And uh, in the meantime... What do they have to stop the bleeding and everything? What's that kind of first 24 hour of medical attention look like? Um, I don't <clears throat> know exactly what all they did, but um, you know they do whatever surgeons do. They get you in the operating table and they close up the oh. blood vessels. And you know, they, so were you operated on in Germany? In Afghanistan, they took me to Camp uh, Bastion, Got it. Camp yep. Leatherneck first, I think, and then Camp okay. uh, Camp Bastion. Or no, they're the same place. And then. Um, Bagram Air Force Base, I think, after that. Got and they're, you know, they're assessing my injuries and making kind of decisions about where to amputate. 
because um, my injuries originally were below the knee, but a lot of the times there's be, there'll be infections that get in there um, or the tissue is just so shredded that the surgeons kind of are thinking about the surgery with respect to later on being able to put prosthetics on your legs. So, so if there's not a whole lot of viable tissue below the knee, they're just gonna amputate above the knee. So below the knee, were they completely 100% severed from the explosion? Yeah, so yeah, I mean, I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't actually look. I sat up to look, but I decided against it. Uh, right then but, and there on the, uh, like in the- Yeah, yeah. Oh. I was kind of worried that it was gonna be like when you're a kid and you scrape your knee, it doesn't hurt that bad. And then you look at it and it's all this pain comes, oh, you know, like that. Yeah. I thought it was gonna be like that. Um, plus, I think in that moment, I made the conscious decision that it probably wasn't uh, an image that I should have uh, in my head for the rest of my life. Right. I don't know how I made that decision, but never I, been in the situation. I but I think that would be uh, yeah. yeah. I sat up about halfway, and I laid back down. Yeah. Um, oh. So I just was told by the guys on site that it was below the knee, yeah. but I don't know exactly. But I, I've heard from other guys that were there that you know, completely severed. It's also a testament to our, our the medical team in the military. Cause I mean, I read a stat years ago, you know, these are the wars with the most amputees, right? I mean, I-, I Yeah, I, cause people are actually surviving. Right, it, right? Yeah. right. They're surviving, but again, most amputees because we're able to provide that emergency treatment right then and there, the tourniquet, life-saving techniques tourniquet, immediately helicopters. to- Right. Yeah. So and then surgeons, it's like phenomenal surgeons. So yeah. So first operation in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. but you were out for that, obviously. Yeah. I mean, for the operate clearly, and then you don't you don't wake up again until Germany. Yeah. And then who was the first first person? Were you were you in a hospital in Germany? Or are you like in an airfield waiting to go back to the states? Uh, hospital, uh, you know, intensive care ward. And I was only there for about twelve hours while I waited. They try and get you back as soon as as possible. Oh, sure. yeah. so I was only there for about twelve hours um, while they stabilized me, made sure I was stable, and then got my aircraft ready, um, or got an aircraft ready for uh, a bunch of guys that were going back. Um, first guy I saw was my squad leader in Germany. Yeah, he had he was there uh, just by chance. He had been in an IED blast uh, before, and they were checking his head out. Jeez. And so, yeah, he came over and saw me, kind of filled me in that my amputations were above the knee. And then I, did, I wasn't conscious for very long. Mm. Kind of got the pertinent details in then. So you, you wake up, you're in Germany, and you're just told, I have two above knee amputations. Yeah. What was the first thought that goes through your head then? Or were you too drugged up per se? To, I mean... Did you, could you process that? The first thought that went through my head at sight of injury was that they should just finish me off there because I didn't really know what life as a amputee was going to be like. I, I figured I would be in a wheelchair forever and I was going to have to have like my mom taking care of me or something and I wasn't going to be able to extra. I, I didn't I didn't know. I was ignorant. And so I, was, I just told those guys, just go ahead and finish me off. Obviously, they didn't. <laughs> um, I didn't really, I th the reaction I had in Germany was surprise because I thought I was going to be a below the knee, which was, I figured was pretty acceptable because you still have your knees uh, in terms of being an amputee. And I figured above the knee would be even worse. And it, it's different. It's definitely different and not as good. Um, but I didn't, I don't think I really had the mental capacity at that point to really have much the of process. a reaction. I was pretty high. Yeah. So... Germany, back stateside mm -hmm. to the medical facility in DC, yeah. in Maryland. Yeah, my memory of that is when they bring you into <coughs> Bethesda, um, they bring you in on a big uh, ambulance. And I remember, I do remember rolling down out of the ambulance and my family was there waiting. Because they bring your family in, they tell you he's coming so that they can be there. And they, you know, my mom was there oh, and all my, my, my full, whole family was there. Oh. And it's, they just kind of said hi as they wheel me in because they need to get me to the hospital. But I have memory of that. Are you in pain at this point? No, not very lucid. Uh, just very flashes of memory, um, flashes of consciousness. Um, they have me on an epidural. They have me on Dilaudid. Mm. There's no pain. Um, but then hallucinations from that. And um, you have violent hallucinations from all the... Dilaudid and the, uh, you know, going into surgery and getting the various forms of that. dilution, uh, yeah. various images, or all of that day, all of 
No. Afghanistan. No hallucinations. Yeah, not even that not even of that in that day. Interesting. Um, for example, I hallucinated once that I was in a bunker with my mom and my legs had been blown off, and there's blood everywhere. But I, I was with my mom. And another time, I hallucinated that, or I dreamed, I don't know, whatever, uh, that I was going out on patrol and somebody shot me in the neck, and everybody else just kept going and just left me there. Oh. And so, yeah, you know, just kind of hallucinations like that. So tell me about the, like the first week at the hospital, back stateside, what was that first week like? Was it just in and out of surgeries? And Yeah, pretty much. Um, in and out of consciousness, in and out of surgeries, uh, in and out of being cold, super cold after a surgery, then being super hot, mm. and then cold, then hot, then cold, then hot. Uh, but also um, kind of flashes of memory of visitors, friends, family, that kind of thing. They were letting into the ICU to come uh, say hi. So I have those memories of seeing people uh, in between surgeries and in between consciousness. When you started getting a more mental clarity of what happened, were there stages, like you know, they, they say stages of grief when you lose somebody, were there stages of anger or a st stages of acceptance that you went through in that first, call it 20 days? Yeah, not for me too much. Um, I think by the time I was conscious, or lucid again, I had already reached the acceptance stage. Um, so I don't know whether I went through all the stages or if I just skipped right to the acceptance stage or I had some sort of a high epiphany that the quicker I get to acceptance, the better off I am and the more time and more energy I can put towards moving forward. Um, and then also I think there was probably an aspect of it that I knew there was a lot of people relying on me to be okay. Mm. after my injury. Uh, the guys back in Afghanistan, mm. my mom, my dad, the rest of my family, my Relying friends. on you to be okay, what do you mean by that? Um, they, what was best for them was for me to be okay. Mm. And so if I, was, if I was going through all these stages of grief and being depressed and lashing out and all these different things, then that's gonna hurt them mm. because that's gonna uh, bring upon a great mental stress upon my mom she doesn't want to, you know, if she sees that, that's going to hurt her badly. Wow. Um, and, you know, after getting the news that I had been wounded. And then in Afghanistan, those guys are going to be checking up on me. You know, they get leave or they get R&R &R from time to time. So they're going to be at wondering how I'm doing, how I'm doing. And if they hear that I'm lashing out at the nurses, I'm depressed, I'm struggling, they're going to be thinking about that while they should be thinking, thinking about the IED that's in the ground or fighting. So I think there was some... <coughs> unconscious or subconscious recognition that that would be the case. And so I think uh, I kind of subconsciously forced myself to be okay quickly. Did you see some people in the hospital that weren't like you though, that weren't accepting it and maybe did have anger or was that couldn't move on as quickly? I think there were some people like that. I don't remember having a clear memory of somebody like that. Um, I didn't do a whole lot of socializing when I was in the hospital and in recovery um, just because I was there, I was focused on my own, my own recovery and just doing what I could. So I didn't, I didn't have deep conversations with a lot of people, but most of the people that I interacted with, um, maybe they didn't get to that point as fast as I did, uh, but most of the people that come through there, I think, are of the same mindset or are of the same kind of thinking that uh, they get through it fast and they move on, they want to do what they can with the rest of their life. And what, so to that point, rest of your life, it seems like you very quickly latched on to a what's next, a, a, yeah. a greater purpose. Yeah, well, you know, I had small little milestones in the beginning, and then as I got stronger and gained strength and gained confidence and that kind of thing, I started being able to think a little bit more long-term. So when I first got to the hospital, all I was thinking about was getting in my wheelchair, which is this really simple, and short-term goal, but that, for me, that was this huge thing, was being able to get my wheelchair by myself and just go wheel around outside somewhere with all these tubes and IVs and catheters and all sorts of stuff. Um, so that was kind of the first thing. And then the next, you know, I wanted to get out of the, uh, get out of Walter, or go get out of Bethesda and go to Walter Reed, which meant that all my surgeries would be completed and my skin graft would be done. I'd be sewn up and sutured and transferred over. And that took a month and then get my prosthetics attached. And so there's a lot of milestones, but each time uh, the, the milestone or the goal 
got further out and further out and further out until eventually, you know, I'm making these like, you know, really long term uh, goals for myself. So, put the long, we'll talk about the goals in a second, but one thing I, I heard you say one time, I mean, you had to relearn to walk yeah. to a certain extent. I mean, there are stages, I mean, the the devices, the prosthesis I'm looking at now, that wasn't day one, right? No. <laughs> I mean, you have to start with, um, and I forget the term, so. Yeah. Shorties. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. had to start with those and kind of what, just graduate to more higher functionality or what, how? Walk. I mean, day one isn't even wearing legs. Day right. one is on a BOSU ball, you know, strengthening your core because you have lost all muscle mass that you had. All your muscle mass goes, atrophies, um, no matter how many calories you eat, huh. it's just all gone. And so you have to re, uh, you have to get back all that strength, or at least some of it anyway. Mm -hmm. And so you start there. That's that's what you, where you start. You're not even in legs. Right. Then you get your legs, and then for, it, ver it it's different for different amputees. Double above the amputee, they start you into shorties, which is the prosthetic socket, which is this thing. And it's just a, a prosthetic foot on the bottom of it, so it's very short. And what you're learning is how to move your body. You're getting your body used to being in leg sockets because it's not comfortable. It hurts and it hurts at first. Um, it feels weird. And so you have to teach your body how to move. Mm. Uh, and so the basic rudimentary ways, it's like learning anything. You learn the rudimentary basics of the skill. So I have to lift my hip up. When I, when I walk a little bit, or I just have to figure out how I can balance on these two little stilts that I'm on now without having a knee, without having an ankle. So I'm learning the very rudimentary basics. And then as I learn those, make it a little bit more difficult by making myself taller. And then eventually I get to a point where I can graduate from these tall versions of shorties to a bionic knee. And that you know brings another layer of complexity because the bionic knee has algorithms that try and predict what I'm trying to do. And so I have to learn how to control those algorithms and get it to do what I want it to do by using my body motion. And then it's, it's complex because there's now a, a hinge that can collapse and you can fall. And so learning it well enough that you're not walking, you're not falling everywhere and hurting yourself. And so then, how, how far into it was a bionic knee? Um, probably four months. Oh, wow. I, yeah. Yeah. From injury to when I got my bionics, maybe four or five months. Wow. So it takes a while. And they do not, they don't you rush said, it You there. said, well, you said, well, I was thinking you were going to say like eight, nine, ten months to a year. At a year, I was already running. Um, let's see, at a year, I was pretty comfortable I wasn't using canes anywhere. I wasn't Are you back home at this? Year? No, I was still in the hospital. I spent a year and a half in the hospital a total. A year and a yeah. half. Not in a, a hospital room, but they had this place called Malone House, which is a hotel that had been re, uh, basically retrofitted to be the outpatient housing for all the guys that were in the physical therapy clinic. And are you still in the Marine Corps at this time? Yeah, still. Still in, recovering, going through the retirement process. Wow. Which I didn't have to retire. They said, you know, like, we can keep you in if you want to stay in. Uh, but I decided that I wasn't going to be able to keep doing the same job. I wasn't going to be able to deploy in the same way that I wanted to. And so I figured it's probably better for me to get out and move on. So that was in 2010. And in what, 2012, you attended the Paralympics in London? Yeah, 2000, uh, uh, end of 2011, I retire. And I had already decided maybe a month before that I was going to try and go to the Paralympics for rowing. So wow. I retire, pack all my stuff up <laughs> into the back of my car, and drive down to Florida to start training with my rowing partner, Oksana. What made you get in, want to do that, set that goal, want to accomplish it? You know, I found out about the Paralympics in the first month that I was at Bethesda. Mm. Um, one of the things that was going through my mind... Um, at site of injury was I'm not going to be able to work out. And I, I, I enjoyed that. You know, being a Marine, being in good shape, that kind of thing. I enjoyed working out and doing these really tough workouts. So now that I had accepted my, uh, my situation, I started researching, well, let's see if I actually, what can a double above the amputee work out? Is that possible? 
And so I started looking up different ways that double above knee amputees work out. So I that seemed to hit you kind of quickly. Then that that from that point, that was kind of uh, at least in your head as the a idea. Plant, yeah, plant I mean, I, I saw it, and I was, well, and I had also been always been interested in the life of an Olympic level athlete. It's like that kind of dedication to a craft. It's it's a lot like being in the Marine Corps, where you're completely dedicated to war fighting. You're dedicated to finding IEDs. So that dedication where that's all you do, that's all you care about, everything that you do and everything that you think reflects back on that objective or that goal. And so that, that lifestyle had always interested me, and I knew that I was never going to be an Olympic athlete, but I kind of saw a possibility in that moment that maybe mm. I might be able to Paralymp be a Paralympic athlete. Um, and then, but yeah, I put it aside because I was early on in the hospital and I didn't know what was uh, what, what was possible for me. Were you married at the time when you were driving down to Florida? Today? No, single. Uh, I had a girlfriend when I was in the hospital, but we broke up right before I left uh, to, to go down to Florida. So I was completely single and I was able to be, I stayed, I didn't go home for Christmas or anything. I was able to be completely selfish, <laughs> uh, which is kind of a requirement when you're when yeah. you're trying to be goals like that yeah when you have a goal like that when you're trying to be the best in the world you know you kind of have to be uh selfish and that's why i didn't really stick with it you know it kind of goes into i mean everybody needs i think a purpose in life i, I, I mean there are stats that say you know purpose in life like that you're happier you can even live to more longevity i mean would you that became really your what's next and your purpose um to a certain extent it became an attempt at finding a purpose. Um, so I think that everybody's purpose in life from a 40,000 foot view is to have an enjoyable life and have a meaningful life. Sure. So a life with meaning that you, that you find to be enjoyable and fulfilling. And so I had that when I was in the Marine Corps. You know, going to war with my Marine brothers uh, was... Life. It had a great, yeah, I mean, I had a, a, a great meaningful purpose and I loved it. And so I kind of lost, I didn't lose that, that overall purpose, but I lost the way, the path towards it, which was the Marine Corps. And so when I recovered and after, when I retired, I had to kind of go on this, this journey to try and rediscover that path towards a meaningful life and towards an enjoyable life. And so the first thing that I tried was rowing. Mm. And I kind of talked about how you have to be selfish when you're rowing. And that's kind of, that's one of the reasons why I didn't stick with rowing after the 20, I did another season after 2012, but it just never really felt, rowing never felt right, completely right. It didn't, it wasn't ticking all the boxes mm -hmm. um, because it didn't really feel like I had a, a greater overall purpose besides just kind of winning a race for myself. Um, and so it didn't really, it didn't sit well um, and so that's why I decided to to move on from rowing. And then you moved on from rowing, went into bike riding. Yeah, but <laughs> I should say um, at the 2012 Paralympics, that's where I met my wife. Oh. She had been rowing for uh, for Great Britain in a different boat class. And oh, so wow. I actually met her there. And, and also in the Paralympics. Partying antics, yeah. Partying antics after the... Uh, after the Paralympics were over. So if you don't mind me asking, is she also an amputee or? She's not an amputee. So she was in a, a different boat class. And so she has uh, psoriatic arthritis. And so her ankle is fused and her wrist is fused. There's limited flexion. Oh, wow. And so those two things combined qualified her for this other boat class, the mixed Cox four. And so we met and then we didn't get together right away, but obviously we ended up getting married. <laughs> That's a good story. In 2017, yeah. So. Fast forward, we're talking about the bike, but then what made you want to do the 31 marathons in 31 different cities in 31 different days? Yeah, so uh, as, as far as the bike ride goes, I wanted to try and do something that had a bigger purpose. So that's why I raised money um, for veteran charities. So I was trying to get that purpose, but I also wanted to do something that really pushed me to my absolute mental and, and, and psychologi psychological and physical limits. Um, Cause I thought that, you know, maybe that would be, you get clarity and, and meaning and purpose behind doing things like that too. So I kind of tried to combine those two things in the bike ride and rode 181 days, 5,200 miles from Bar Harbor, Maine to Camp Pendleton, California on my bike through the winter, the polar vortex. And um, 
got to the end, extremely proud, happy with, with what I did, but still wasn't quite feeling totally fulfilled. Um, and then I tried to go back to the Paralympics in triathlon, but failed miserably to qualify in triathlon. Um, but while I was doing triathlon, I kind of rediscovered that I had always had this kind of natural talent for running. I'd always been the fastest kid in my class, or one of the fastest kids in my class in elementary all the way through high school. Um, always been able to get a good score on the Marine Corps PFT with very little running training. Uh, and when I was training for triathlon, I was able to get down to an 18-minute 5K in you know, less than a year. Okay. which is the Marine Corps PFT, you know, perfect score. Um, and then also during that time, I ran the Marine Corps Marathon. So I kind of figured that I found out that I could run marathons and I, I, my body could handle that. And so when I failed, um, when I failed the, the attempt to make the Paralympics in 2016, I kind of had this realization that the, the reason that the bike ride didn't sit completely well with me was that I was out there trying to push myself, see what I could do, see what I was capable of. The driving purpose behind the bike ride was still mostly about me, seeing what I could do. And then I had the fundraising kind of as a byproduct of it. And so what I needed to do, I realized, was do something like the bike ride, something physically and mentally demanding uh, that's going to push me to my limits, but the overall purpose, the underlying reason for me doing it had to be for some, for greater. yeah, to be greater than myself, it had to be. That's why I joined the Marine Corps to be a part of something bigger than myself, to have a a purpose beyond that. Yeah. And so the purpose that I decided that needed to be addressed was, you know, in recent history, I started seeing all these stories about the only story I really ever saw about veterans was the story of the hero veteran at war, or the basket case broken veteran at home. Hmm. Um, and that's the only two stories I really ever saw in the news, in songs, in movies, in yeah. TV shows. It's the hero or it's the guy with a thousand yard stare that can't handle being in a room by himself uh, or by herself. And so I knew it to be true that that was the minority of cases. Interesting. Um, it's something that happens and it's an important story, but it was the minority of cases from my experience. All the amputees that I saw, you know, were well-adjusted individuals. Um, all the guys that I knew pretty much were well-adjusted individuals. It was the vast minority, and that's backed up by statistics. You know, it's 7% of combat veterans have PTSD, and I think 25% of uh, non-combat veterans have PTSD. So I knew that was minority, but it was the majority of the story that we were hearing. So I wanted to affect that by making my own story mm. and doing something that, I, that was so mind-blowing and difficult for people to comprehend that the news and ever, people wouldn't be able to help but pay attention to it. And that's kind of how I came up with the month of marathons. Wow. So how did you start training for it? Uh, well, first thing I did was make sure that Pam was going to be on board for helping me, uh, <laughs> my wife. Uh, she was my wife at the time, but uh, and she was still living in England. But I told her the idea, and she thought it was a great idea. Um, and she, she, was going, she defended her title in 2016. She won in t 2012. And she won again in 2016, and once she uh, won, she was able to help me full time. And then, uh, wow. but I started training pretty much the moment that I, in 20, probably spring of 2016, I started training, and I started slow, and I just kind of tried to build, uh, build gradually. So I started with running three times a week, one hour, and that was it, um, at a heart rate that was completely aerobic. Um, because one of the things I figured was that I needed to run all these marathons at a controlled pace such that my body wasn't going to be too overtaxed on any one day so that I could keep going and keep going. Yeah. So I wasn't running all these marathons max pace. I was running a very controlled, very Makes sense. Um, yeah, slow pace. And so I just every six weeks I just tried to increase the stress of my training. So eventually I just would increase it either by running more uh, times throughout the week, running longer, or grouping my runs together differently um, until eventually the last 12 weeks I was running two hours on Monday, two hours Wednesday, marathon on Thursday, and then 90 minutes Friday, and then going to the gym Tuesday and, and Saturday and taking off. And then you had a date when it said, okay, we're starting on this date, and we're doing yeah. 31 days consecutive. 31 days 31. consecutive. And then I would, every six weeks, I would kind of practice a little bit 
for the month of marathon. So I ran one marathon after my first six weeks. And then I tried two. I actually failed doing to do two on my first attempt. Uh, but I would do two, and then I would do three, and then four, and then five. And this try practicing different ways to pace the marathons, mm. different ways that I could break the distance up in order to make sure that I didn't overtax myself, practicing what I was going to eat during the marathons, practicing what I was going to eat after the marathons, practicing different recovery practices I could use. Like what's a um, recovery practice as an example? Yeah, uh, like massage mm. or foam rolling or just laying in bed, <laughs> you know, just uh, different ways that I could, or stretching or things like that. Or and just what to eat, what was going to sit well in my stomach while I ran and then after I ran, and what was going to give me enough calories to, you know, go uh, the next day. Like the reason I failed my first two marathon attempt is because I didn't eat enough after the first one. Interesting. And so the second day I ran, completely bonked and ran out of energy. Mm. And so I kind of had to do that practice to mm. figure out. Mm. And then along the course of that time, we had to um, plan out the logistics of it, like where we were going to get a 37-foot RV that we could rent that wasn't going to cost an arm and a leg. And you slept in this RV? We slept in the RV, and my wife Pam and my buddy Colin drove it. So they kind of went back and forth. Uh, Pam project managed the whole thing. Uh, I was The only thing I did during the month of marathons was... Show up and run. <laughs> show up and run, and then do interviews, eat, sleep. That was all I did. Um, but yeah, we had to figure out where I was going to... Which cities I was going to run in, uh, where in each city I was going to run, where we could park the RV. So that wasn't going to be a problem. Uh, where we could park the RV overnight, because sometimes I would run in a park, and it would be... You can't park in a park overnight, so we'd have to park at like a Walmart and then drive... So all these different things, and then just kind of working on the storytelling aspect of it, getting the PR out there, getting interviews uh, in advance. Like I got Fox and Friends, I got Megyn Kelly, so kind of some of these bigger publications and bigger shows. Uh, but then eventually it all came together, November or October 12th, I started in London, and ran, and then went to Philadelphia overnight, and then uh, That's crazy. went around the country. That's with insane. With a stop in always... You know, I'm on a lifelong journey to always find out what it is that, you know, and we were talking a little bit off camera about this, what it, is it about people like yourself that suffers this tragic situation and you just turn it into a positive that most people can't even fathom? And yeah. You know, I just, I, I never understand what that answer is. I don't understand what that answer is. I don't know that, you know, I don't think there is one answer, but I'm sure it has some combination of previous experiences that got you to a point where you, when the stress happens, that you have certain strategies or certain resiliences built up mm. um, that can, that allow you to withstand the stress and then move on and have that mindset that you need to move on. Um, and then also having people around you that will help you with that. Like I've, throughout my entire, sure. from the second I was injured, I had teams of people helping me out. You know, I, I didn't do any of this stuff by myself. I always had teams and teams of people that were there taking an active participation, being positive mentors um, and, you know, allies to me throughout the entire time. And you've seen most amputees from military speaking that you've come in contact with have kind of found their what's next and are, are very well adjusted? From my experience, yeah. I mean, most of most the guys and gals, they, not everybody does what I do, but a lot of them go to the Paralympics. Uh, a lot of them just find regular work. Some of them just retire and they just enjoy yeah. their life. Like I know a guy named Aaron. He just he skis all the time. That's all he does, um, and he loves that. his life. Hey, so that's the goal for I everybody. Think, just lo love your life and be happy. And I think that's the case for most veterans. I mean, um, from my experience, most of them are able to transition well. Not everybody can, but a lot. Most of them transition well and become active members of civilian world uh, and use their time in the military, the strengths that it gave them, the lessons that it taught them to apply that to their civilian life. I see that too. Yeah. So what's next in the, I mean, I know we're coming off a real funky kind of time in, in yeah. the world with everything that's been going on, the pandemic, but I mean, what's what's next on, on your agenda? Uh, well, Pam and I have a son now. He turned two yesterday. Okay. No uh, and cool. hopefully another one on the way soon. Nice. And uh, I'm writing, working on a book about... It's interesting that you ask the question about what makes some people be able to move on and what makes some people not be able to move on. Because my book is going to be, it's my story, but it's going to be about a reverse engineered system. That I, I, I took a look at my story 
or why I, I thought that very same question about what, what you asked. And I, I, I took a, a look at everything from my injury or even before my injury to end of the month of marathons. And I tried to pull out, well, reverse engineer a possible system that I may have used or a series of steps, an algorithm or something like that, that I plug, that I can, you know, that I used maybe subconsciously, not, not in the moment. And before you go on, are you saying a system to, that found your what's next or a system of, hey, once I want to do the marathons and the Olympics, what got you there or just how you got your life to the next level? All the above. Like a system that you can use for big uh, negative tragedies, like losing your legs, all the way down to a small moment, like on the month of marathons, I injured my back, and this system can get me from this step to the next step. Or I lay it on me. What's the secret? Well, I, I haven't. <laughs> I'm not finished developing it yet, but it's you know, it's just, it's just you break. Every challenge is broken down into to three, um, three sections: survive, recover, and live. That's kind of my saying. So, an example. Let's talk about my overall story: survive, don't die. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, it doesn't have to be in that in those terms. It could be surviving the initial temptation to eat a donut when you're on a diet or something like that. Mm. Or it could be surviving the initial reaction when somebody makes you angry mm. to to get angry at them. You know, it could be anything like that. Interesting. Um, so there's a lot so of, survive that, for me was don't die. Part of survive is that also willpower and discipline. Yeah, yeah, all these things. Um, so once I got to a point where I was stabilized and it was likely that I probably wasn't going to die, that starts the recovery. So that's the recover stage. And the recover stage for me lasted all the way until I retired. And the live stage was when I used all that stuff, um, all the lessons I learned, all the tools that I built, all the people that I met, the resources that I gained to make my life better than I thought I ever could have been possible. And that's the rowing, and then that's the other stuff after that. And so what I'm working on is the series of steps within that. So, uh, you know, like find the help. This isn't in the order, but find the help that you need. Um, figure out what tools you, you know, assess uh, what tools you have. You know, you have your goal. Assess the tools that you have that can help that goal. Assess the tools that you need to get to that goal. And then put them into two separate columns. We also said, I think a key word, Goal. I mean, a lot of people, I yeah, think, that's a big part of it. may not have a goal or a purpose to work towards. Yeah. I mean, as, as sad as it is, how many people, I mean, even without your situation, people that have their legs, how many mm -hmm. of them just mind num, num, numbingly just go through life and, and don't have some goal or purpose they work towards? Luckily yep. for me, obviously nothing like y you went through, but I got out of the military. You know, I had three back-to-back -back deployments to Iraq and, you know, saw some stuff, did some stuff, whatever, got out. I very quickly latched on to entrepreneurship. Yeah. Uh, had one job, lasted two, three weeks. Yeah. I was back in, like, 2007, and that's, luckily for me, that's been my what's next. Yeah. But to your point, that goal, I think, is critically important. And it doesn't have to be, you don't have to, you know, when you, when you get out or when you transition at some point, you don't have to have, I didn't have the Paralympics as my right. goal. The second I was injured, I had Could be get small. out of bed. Right. I, had, I had I don't die. You know, I had uh, yeah. get into my wheelchair. That was it. And so, just because you transition, you don't have to come up with this big goal I right agree. away. Come up with something that gets you a little bit further down the road. Buys you time to think. Buys you right. time to get accustomed to what's right. going on. Have something. It doesn't have to be the end goal. It doesn't have to be your ultimate goal. But have something. Yeah. That you're working towards. That's that's in the near future. That yeah. you can kind of use to to give you strength. But I agree. <clears throat> That's something that I'm working on. That's cool. And then the other thing I'm working on is trying to spread, keep spreading my story through speaking engagements and um, trying to help people, you know, see, um, you know, to see a way through their own challenges, their own difficulties by giving them my example and giving them the lessons that I shared with you. Well, you're a great speaker. I've seen you on, I've seen you on numerous platforms, lots of podcasts. This one will be out shortly as well. Uh, where can everybody find you at? Is it Rob, robjonesjourney.com? Yep, my website's robjonesjourney.com, and all my social media is at robjonesjourney, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, all at robjonesjourney. That's awesome, man. Amazing. Well, I know you inspired a lot of veterans. Thanks you inspired me, me from the day I saw you. 
And um, everything you say just ring for, rings true to me, and I know it's going to ring true uh, to a lot of people that listen to this. So appreciate it, man. Thanks, thanks for, for having the me. Trip out here. I'm honored. Thank you.